John chapter 10, we are continuing our walk through the book of John. And last week we talked about the good shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He was relating himself to something that everybody could understand. Abraham was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. Isaac, Jacob, King David, they're all shepherds. And so as he's talking to people, he's talking to people that, like I mentioned last week, it's like me talking about baseball. I'm like a baseball game. Oh, I know baseball. How are you like a baseball game? So when he's saying he's the good shepherd, he's relating to something very familiar. So now we get in the last part of the same chapter after he says, I am the good shepherd. In our outline here, we're in the second part where Jesus shows himself publicly. He started out by meeting with individuals and in small groups of people. Why? Because he knew once he went public, because he is who he is, he knew that he would be rejected by the people when he went public. And his time to fulfill everything that was written in the Bible needed to happen. So he waited a little bit till he went public because then going public was going to lead to him being killed. Talk about knowing your mission in life. So here we are in our outline of the book. As we look at where we're going, we're still in this portion. We're in chapter 10. So we're in this period of conflict where Jesus starts to go public and creates conflict. Drama. Nobody likes drama, right? Jesus today would be reality TV. Here's this guy who thinks he's God in the flesh. Jesus, in this passage, very plainly says, I and the Father are one. And people don't like that. People don't like what he's claiming there. So let me read the passage, John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. It says, Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe. Because you are not my sheep, as I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, It is not written in your law, I said you are God's. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I am in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true, and many believed in him there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we read this passage, I Hope that we will all have the understanding of who you are. 
These men came and asked Jesus to tell them plainly who he is. And yet, as we read this book, that's almost comical. We're in the 10th chapter of him explaining who he is. If people don't want any part of God, they won't have any part of him. If they have room in their heart for God, they will open that door. They will see him, perhaps come to believe in him. Father, I can only imagine how frustrating it is for you to know all that you've done. And yet people will not see. They will not believe. They will not accept all that you have done. They won't accept you into their lives. Father, I pray that as we read this passage that we will be encouraged because we have accepted you into our life. We have trusted in you and what you have done for us. So, Father, may we be encouraged as we read through this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. John 10, 22. Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. What is the Feast of Dedication? This was the rededication of the temple in 165 B.C. They're coming together to commemorate that. It had become a national annual thing. So they've come together at this time of dedication, basically a party. Solomon's porch, if you look up at the, the top right of the screen, you've got Solomon's porch up there. I sketched this last night. I hope it's okay. Here we have the temple, right? Again, what's the temple? In the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt from Yule Brenner by way of uh, Charlton Heston, as we understand it, they come out of Egypt and God says, I want to dwell with you. I want you and me to be close. You are my people. So he says, build a tent. And in the tent, there's going to be certain things that you're going to come into the tent to do. And I will be in the tent. So I will always be with you. It's kind of an RV version of the temple. It's a tent on wheels. Here you have this tent. Wherever you go, take the tent with you, set it up. I will be in the tent. I will dwell with you. If we go back further, Adam and Eve, God walked through the garden with people. He didn't create us to be like, all right, off you go. No, he created us to dwell with us. He created us because he wanted us. We're wanted by God. So in Adam and Eve, he walked in the garden. They disobeyed. He kicked them out of the garden. He creates a special people to dwell with. Create a tent. And then you move forward where eventually during Solomon's time, now that you're in the land, build a temple. You don't need the tent anymore because it doesn't need to be mobile. You're in the land. Here's the temple. I will dwell in the temple. The holy place up at the top is where the glory of God would dwell. So here we are. We're at this location, very sacred, very historical, very, it's a big deal. The temple grounds. I mean, Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. So now we know where this is taking place. Solomon's porch. If you are the Christ, just tell us plainly. I mean, what are you saying? 5, 19 to 24. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. This is I am God language. For the Father judges no one but has committed all judgment to the Son, me. That all should honor the Son, me. Just as they honor the Father, God in heaven, the one you believe in, you know. He who does not honor the Son, me, does not honor the Father who sent him. That's pretty strong language. Let's go to 6, 28. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Strong language. Verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 40, 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son, me, and believes in him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Strong language. That's God language. Verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Verse 47. Most surely I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. And remember, every time he says, I am something, he is equating himself back to Moses in the burning bush when Moses said, Okay, I'm going to go back to Egypt, but they want to know who you are. Who am I going to say is sending me? And God said, tell them that I am. That literally means the self-existent one. I am. So all of these I am statements mean I am God, basically. 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Chapter 7, 28 says, Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from, and I have not come of myself. But he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. He is saying, I am from heaven. I and the Father are equals. Verses 36 to 38, what is this thing that he said? You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. 8.14, Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. Again, talking about his origin place is heaven. Verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Verse 29, And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I always do those things that please him. Verse 36. Therefore, if the Son, me, the Son, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. The Son is claiming to have the power to set people free. Verse 58. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That's him saying, I am God, right? Chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Again, being sent by God. Verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Chapter 10. Isn't this fun? Chapter 10, 7 to 9. Then Jesus said to them again, Most surely I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. Verses 17 and 18. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Again, having power over life and death. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Verse 24. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. <laughs> what? Uh, John 10, 25. I told you, and you do not believe. I have told you. I have done miracles, sign, miracle, synonyms in the Bible, right? He did many signs. What, were, what are signs? They point you, right? They tell you what to do. So miracles in the Bible are supposed to point you to Christ. I told you, like more than once, who I am. You do not believe. They have come to their decision. 
Nothing more frustrating than talking to somebody about Christ and they just say no. I have told you and you've chosen not to believe. That's a sad day. You are not my sheep, 25 to 27. I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do, I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. They show you who I am. I heal the sick. You're not seeing those as signs. You're seeing those as threat to your authority, threat to your power. You're not seeing them for what they are. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. You are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So, my sheep hear my voice. They are open to hear me. These are people that have an openness to God. You don't. Number two, I know them. They have believed in me, and then they follow me. We have a relationship. You're not in that group. You're not any of these things. Because you are your own roadblock. You're your own wall. I can't get through there, man. You're not even open to discuss these things. You're not open in your heart to figure out what God is doing here. We've none signs to point you, to validate who I am. And you still, you look at it as a threat. Why? Because you're self-driven. Your life is all about you. It's not about glorifying God. It's not about figuring out who he is and what does he want me to do. Nah, too busy for that. You're too busy. You're worried about yourself, not God Almighty. Who cares what he thinks? 10, 28, 29, and I give them, memorize this verse. This is a great verse. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. We have what we call eternal security. We trusted Christ as our Savior. Bam. You are now in the hand of God. Who put you there? He did. I give them, I give them eternal life. And nobody will snatch them out of my hand. There used to be a, used to be a pastor a friend of mine from years ago who played college sports. He's kind of a big guy. Not real big, but big enough to have some muscle tone. And he used to do this thing at camp where he would take out, it was either 20 bucks or 100 bucks, I can't remember. But he'd ask for the toughest guy in the room. Who's the toughest guy in the room? And everybody would typically point to the same guy. You know, I mean, as teenagers, you tend to know who the big man on campus is at your school, right? He's the one that can beat us all up, that guy. So he goes, okay, come on up here. And he'd call the kid up on stage and he'd go, 20 bucks, do you want it? Kid would be like, yeah. And he goes, okay. Get it out of my hand and it's yours. He goes, I want you to take that out of my hand. And this kid will do all kinds of things. And I tell you what, if somebody has their grip like this, you better be in, you're going to be in for a long day trying to open up somebody's fist. I've tried to do that in law enforcement. Putting people in handcuffs is difficult. If they don't want to go in handcuffs, we do what we call pain compliance. Why? Because if I can't get your arms back, I do other things to make you say, ouch. So that you'll then go, okay, I will put my hands back. Because we rarely move people's hands if they really don't want them in that place. I don't get them. A resistor is very difficult to deal with. But he'd have somebody come up and he'd say, okay, grab my hand and pull that money out. And he goes, you can't snatch that out of my hand, can you? Then he ended up giving him the 20 bucks anyway upon his failure. But that's a good visual of we're in God's hand. It's his power. Well, can I jump out of his hand? No. Why? Because he is holding you. You're not in there stepping on the edge of God's hand going, do I want to stay or do I want to go? No. He is holding you. You have nothing to do with the equation. You trusted him as your savior, placed you in his hand, and he says, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, nor shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Strong words of eternal security. Learn to love it and embrace it. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you have an eternal home in heaven. It can never be taken away. They didn't earn it. They accepted it. They shall never perish. It's a forever promise. No one can snatch them out of my 
my or my father's hand, we are kept through God's power. Isn't that nice? That is nice. So here we have, they hear my voice, sensitivity, fellowship, I know them, obedience, they follow me, life, I give them eternal life, assurance, they shall never perish, and security, no one can snatch them out of my hand. The spirit of what God through the Son has done for us. 1030, I and my Father are one. That was his answer. Tell us plainly. I mean, just lay it down for us. We're simple-minded people, which they really didn't believe that. They thought they were all geniuses. Make it plain. Why did they want it to be made plain? Because they wanted to murder him. That's why they wanted it plain. They're not looking at, okay, we'll give you this last chance. Tell us plainly who you are so that we can respond accordingly. What they were wanting to do was kill him and him committing blasphemy. Aha. So tell us plainly, are you God? Answer, I and my father are one. There's your clear cut answer. What about Jehovah's Witnesses that don't believe Jesus is really God in the flesh? I and my Father are one. We can go all around the world and all the religions. Who is Jesus? I believe he was a good man, not quite God. I and my Father are one. I believe Jesus was a prophet. He was chosen by God to come and do things, but he wasn't God himself. I and my Father are one. You can go all over the world. This is very plainly put, I am God. How do I know that? Good question. Next verse. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Why would they stone him if he's saying, what I mean by this is I'm a pretty good dude. What I'm saying is I'm a nice guy. What I'm saying is I'm a prophet. What I'm saying is, why? Verse 33. Then Jews, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. The Bible is, isn't it nice? It translates itself for us. What was he saying there? That I'm God. How do we know that? Because his audience there, that's what they understood it to mean. He was exactly saying that I am God. So you can go all over the world and define Jesus by what you think. But if you define him anything less than God himself, you're inaccurate. They took up stones to stone him. They didn't want, are you God? Yes. Okay, then we'll believe in you. No, that's not what they were after. Are you God? Yes. See, he is loony. Let's kill this guy. How unfortunate. Tell us plainly who you are. Not only had he been saying that, but it helps define what they were really after. They wanted to kill him. Jesus again justifies himself. I have showed you many good works. Verse 32. Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Okay, so I, I healed a blind man. I healed a, a lame guy. Is that why you're stoning me? Because all these people have been made well? Nope. What do they say? It's for blasphemy. Because we have decided already who you are. In spite of what you're doing, we want you to die. We don't want you to be God. We don't want you to be our Messiah. We miss what you just said because we are blind, deaf, and dumb. That's my interpretation of what they just did. No, no. I know you just said that you and the Father are one, making you equal with God. Sorry. Whoop! Right over our heads because that's not what we're after. You are committing blasphemy. That's what we're after. Now we're talking. Show our power and authority. That's what we're after. All right, so a little rabbinic discussion on Psalm 82. Let's see. Let's go to Psalm chapter 82. All right, verse 34 of the book of John says, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, you are God's. So Psalm 82 says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality with the wicked? Defend the poor and fearless and fatherless. 
Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not nor they do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. Verse 6 is the important verse here. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. So we have this directed to their Old Testament law, the book of Psalms. And in John 34, 1034, he's quoting this Psalms passage and referring back to it. God is a true judge, according to that passage. Men who were failing to provide true judgment for God, or in verses 2 through 7, you are gods, like in this passage. He's equating them to these gods. And what he's doing is he's basically saying, your authority is equating you to these gods, and yet you're judging me. When the scripture says that you are gods, you're looking at me because I'm claiming that? Do not say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. What is the point? Since their authority called their judges gods, the Jews couldn't accuse him of blasphemy for calling himself the Son of God since he was under divine orders by God. He was truly the Son of God. And God was referring to them in that passage as gods. The Jews sought to kill Jesus again, but he was divinely protected again. I always think this is comical. I'm a real practical guy. I like to visualize things when I read them. And when the Bible says that Jesus moved between the midst of them, I always wonder what that's like. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. How? Was he like, look, you know, and he ran the other way? I don't know. I can't help but read that in scripture. Well, I want to know, like, how? How did he escape? You know, caw -caw! you know, did he make a bird? You know, I don't know. That's the simple minded me coming out. I want to know. The witness of John the Baptist is still true and effective. Therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. And there he stayed. Do you remember the map where John was baptizing when we looked at the map before? Just above the Sea of Galilee, just on the east side of the Jordan River. And then many came to him and said, John performed no signs. John was not a miracle worker. He was a baptizer. But all the things that John spoke about this man were true about Christ. And many believed in him there. So, as we summarize and finish up, Jesus has stated plainly that he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the chosen one. He is the promised one. They're all the same term. He is the one that the entire Old Testament talks about coming someday. To save the day. Save everybody. Those that believe in him that accept him. The whole Bible is about him. He stated it plainly. These guys had no open-mindedness. No, they teach about God. They just don't want to really live for God. Jesus doesn't make anyone believe they must be open to receive his word. What a sad tale did you know that during the millennial kingdom, when Jesus himself is reigning on earth, people aren't going to trust in him? What do you need? What do you need to see? That's why I said, as we study this book, why doesn't God open the clouds and have laser beams and flying sharks? And he says, I'm God, believe in me. Why doesn't he do all these things? Because he has. He's going to be ruling on earth himself. And people are still not going to believe in him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You either believe in him or you don't. He can show all the miracles in the world. 
and everybody is going to have their own interpretation. No, that's not God. That's aliens. No, that's not God. That's the earth. Those are gases from the earth. No, that's not. Why? Because you're either open to God and acknowledge him or you don't. If he's not even in your contemplation, God can do anything, and you're not going to see it as God. That's the sad, sad story of mankind. God has done all kinds of things. God led the children across dry ground, parted a sea. What did they do when they got to the other side? Complained. What, did you leave us out here to die? I just brought you across dry ground in between a sea. It's a sad tale of, of our mindset. Jesus doesn't make anyone believe. They must be open to receive his word. Once you believe in Christ, you are eternally secure in him. He holds you. You don't hold on to yourself. Boy, I sure hope my grip is strong so I can stay in as a child of God. Nope, that's up to him. I'm sure he did that on purpose. Why? Because we'd all be lost, right? The Jews sought only to kill him, not listen to him. Jesus went to where the people were open to his word, and that's back where John was baptizing originally. A lot of the people in that area were open-minded and would listen to his word. So we went back, a little evangelism by way of Jesus. Isn't that nice? Questions come up. What kind of things can we draw from this? How close-minded are you? How close-minded are you moment by moment? We're talking about trusting Christ as your Savior, but what about throughout the day? Does God have anything to do with anything that you're doing? Nah, I, I left him at home. We have all these questions that come up from this story of how their, their mindset was. Do we have their mindset? We see how frustrating it is for Jesus to say plainly, I've already told you, and you choose not to believe. Good luck with that. I'm the righteous judge, and one day you're going to stand before me not able to do whatever you want to do. You're going to stand there and not move. Give an account. It's very sad. But there we have in the context of I'm the good shepherd. I've plainly told you who I am. I've plainly told you what it looks like when people come to the good shepherd, and yet you still ask me who I am. You know what? I'm out of here. I'm going to go talk to people that aren't blind and dumb and deaf. I'm going to move on. And so he went back to that area where people were open to hear God's word. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much that it explains plainly who you are. And Lord, we either believe that and have it affect our lives or we don't. There is nothing that can be done to convince people that are in darkness and enjoy darkness, that there is light out there. If people don't want to see the light, they won't. It's really sad, but it's true. Father, thank you so much. Those of us that have seen you have seen the light and have responded in faith and belief, and we are securely in your hand. We thank you so much for that. It's so simple of a message, but yet, Apparently, people just still can't see it to, to believe in it. Father, I pray that you would help us to not have the mindset of these men that shut down God and everything that he was doing, but that we are open to what you are doing. We're open to let you live your life through us so that other people can see you in us. Lord, thank you for loving us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.